let's start. Again, sorry, but this is quite similar, uh, you know, like the talk that we had yesterday. Promise are so passe. There are some differences, not that much, but yeah, that's it. So the evolution of asynchronous JavaScript. <laughs> and of course, the pointer's not working. Okay, so I'm Chirpo. Um, I'm an Italian slash Belgian guy. I live in London. I work for uh, Sainsbury's, which is a, a, one of the biggest retailers in, uh, in the UK. And, and I'm also a supporter of several communities like Web Devs, Web Dev London, and CodeMotion. So this talk is about JavaScript, right? How many front-enders, front-end developers we have here in this room? I'm so sorry, guys, but last time I did something very quite from A to Z in JavaScript in the front-end. I was using Scriptaculous and Prototype. I don't know how many of you remember this, but that was the React, React thing at that time. And so how did I fall in love with JavaScript? How did I start using JavaScript properly, not just with jQuery, manipulated the DOM? So basically, in my previous experience, uh, we moved the monolithic architecture in PHP uh, to a microservice architecture using Node.js. I was super happy. I said, OK, now let's use JavaScript. But it wasn't that easy. So uh, let's talk a bit about the evolution of JavaScript and, the and how it handles asynchrony in general. So what's asynchrony? Basically, asynchrony is the uh, relationship between now and later. So I was a sad panda because at the beginning I wasn't understanding that okay, quite clearly because I was coming from PHP, a bit of Python, a bit of Java, C. So I couldn't really uh, grasp the idea of asynchrony in JavaScript. So because the, the issue, let's say, at, that I had at the beginning was, the, was how can I express and manipulate program behaviors over a period of time in a synchronous way with JavaScript. So at the beginning, I tried, I tried hard, when, as we are used to, right? With trial and errors, let's try to do this, do that, and try to understand. But at the end, I decided, OK, let's, maybe I should study a bit. I should understand how JavaScript works to grasp the idea of asynchrony in JavaScript. So let's talk a bit about the concurrency, concurrency model and the event loop in JavaScript. So like many languages, of course, um, JavaScript has the stack, a heap, but it also has something uh, peculiar, the queue. What's this queue? So basically in JavaScript, um, JavaScript runtime contains a queue, which is a list of messages to be processed. What are these messages? Basically all these messages has a function, a function call, let's say, and, are, and they are isolated. And that was something that should stick in your mind because, I mean, Probably lots of you had, still has issue, had issue in the past with the this keyword in, in JavaScript, right? Because if you are coming from Java, PHP, uh, Python, whatever, you think that this is something that you already understand from the code you write. But this thing can change. We know that change over the, the execution of your JavaScript program. And why? Because everything is in an isolation and is in this queue. So basically every time a function is executed, and this has been removed from the stack, another one will be executed in total isolation. And what's this queue? It's the famous event loop, right? So basically, this is a very silly and simple implementation of the event loop. So we have this queue, we wait for a message. When there is a message and the stack is empty, you, pr you process then the next message. This is a classic uh, graph, let's say image, of the event loop. As we can see, basically we have this event queue then one message at a time, one function at a time, will be processed. And if it's uh, something asynchronous, like an I.O., like a request to the index DB, or um, an Ajax request, whatever, or even a user, in user interaction, it will be put in a thread pool and executed independently. But the, the Java runtime is not, let's say JavaScript is not waiting uh, for the result. So it will process the next message immediately. And once the results are ready on the other end, basically it will be requeued again and so on and so forth. So that's the, the great thing because JavaScript is non-blocking in this way. And this is super awesome for, for the web because it has to be non-blocking. So it's very good for I.O., for I.O. interaction. It's not that good for uh, CPU intensive task, right? Because you can still block if you are executing a, a huge task. So that's why Node.js was, uh, let's say, 
got his momentum and is still a great platform because it empowers the meaning of the web itself. But one of the things that I learned is that basically JavaScript itself, the language, doesn't know anything about uh, asynchrony in general. I mean, till uh, ECMAScript 2015, we will see that why. So basically, who is handling this uh, asynchronous thing, okay? Is the engine behind, like V8 or the other uh, uh, JavaScript engine you can find in Mozilla and uh, in um, Internet Explorer and so on and so forth. So again, asynchrony is a bit hard because sometimes we, it's difficult to understand what's, is hap what's happening now and how, when later will happen. Can we do that in JavaScript? So can we just fire up a, 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 an AJAX or an XHR request and output the, the, the data? Yes, we can do that, but we have to block the AJAX request, right? So asynchrony, async is great, but can be hard. And why it's hard? Because unfortunately, we have a sequential brain. I mean, I'm not talking about, uh, of course, the uh, involuntary sub subconscious and the brain function in general, but we, when we want to, when we want to do something, we, 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 can't, we are not multitasker, basically. So let's take this example, very simple example. Let's say that we have a card, that we have an e-commerce. And when you do want to go to the checkout, basically, you want to load the user info, the card items, you want to retrieve the exchange rates because let's say that you also want to be international and you want to be accurate about the, the currency conversions. And then you calculate the total. Can we write code in this way in, in JavaScript? Yes, we could, but we are blocking, right? So again, the, the, the main issue, let's say, is that our brain is not trained and is not ready to, to understand uh, asynchronous code in, written in JavaScript. We, we have to be trained. So, so because we have to wait for asynchronous data, asynchronous code. What if we waiting uh, were, just, it was, uh, were just easy as blocking, as we were used to maybe in other languages? Remember that block, remember this thing, it's like saying pull, okay, because you are getting immediately a, a value. So in this example, for, let's, let's say that load user info is in a, a blocking call, or it, it's not even in a synchronous call. Basically, it's something that we, you retrieve immediately, okay? So basically, you are pull, okay, give me the value, give me that damn value. So again, block is like pull. And how do we... How do we express a synchrony in, in, in JavaScript? Of course, we call back, right? How can we do that? You see, PZ, basically, every time you have a, an asynchronous call, basically, you pass a callback. You pass another, another function, function, and so on and so forth. So once the previous one has the data ready or has an error or whatever, returns something, you, you go further with the, with, the, with the callback and so on and so forth. So you end up with this situation, right? So this is called the pyramid of doom or callback hell. So people get freaked out about this thing and all the presentation about JavaScript. Oh, we have the callback hell. How can we solve that? But sometimes I think it's a little bit, let's say, bullshit in the sense that, yeah, callback hell is possible. Uh, it's something that we can easily achieve if we are lazy. But sometimes we can also avoid that. And sometimes we don't want to do that because we are lazy, not in a good way. So let's take this example, a very simple example. This is on Node.js. So let's say that you have a to-do list, okay, on your file system, and you want to add a new to-do. So what you do, you read the file, you add your to-do, you close the file, etc. The code here is very simple and easy. It's very easy to, to read, right? But we can still start seeing a, a Christmas tree, a pyramid of doom, right? Can we do better? Yes, we can avoid that. For example, just give some a name of your, to your callback, to your functions. So as you can see here, basically, uh, the app to do is the function itself, and even notifying the error, and even reporting the, dealing with the error is another function. In this case, you can easily reuse your code, and it's still readable. Remember when before I told you that blocking or getting the value immediately is like a pool? In the case where, where you have an async call, Basically, the sync callback is like a push. Because in this case, our 
then our value, our to do, is returned um, from someone else that's going to push the, the data back. So again, a sync callback is like push. So what are the main issues, let's say, with drawbacks, with uh, callbacks? A bit of, of control flow, not the callback hell from my point of view, in the sense that it can still be an issue, but we can avoid that. One of the main things is the error handling, the drawbacks. In this case, this is some, a convention that you can find in Node.js, for example, and even in other platform. Basically, you pass your error around, and it's the first argument. So you're cluttering a bit your code here and there. So even if you don't have an error, you still have to uh, apply the convention that the first thing, the first argument that you pass to a, to a function to callback is the error. But there's another drawback of co using callbacks. is the inversion of control or Hollywood principle. Don't call us, we'll call you, which is a pattern, which is not bad per se, which is also a common pattern in lots of framework. So basically, instead of programmatically call you, calling what you need, basically you can have a series of events that will, will, uh, will take the data, the, your action forward. So it's, a good, it's a, still a good pattern. It's still a good, good thing, a way of, of architecture your platform. But there's a small issue. It can be a small issue. Let's say that the retrieve exchange rates is a function. It's something that you didn't code. Because you as a company says, oh, fuck it, I don't want to deal, I don't want to handle the exchange rate service. I'm paying, let's say, $10 a month, and uh, someone else uh, will give me back the exchange rates. So you pay the service, they're gonna, gonna give you an awesome library written by them, and you're gonna plug it into, into your code. We do that every day, basically, right? So, but, so we don't have control of, over that function. So what if, for example, this function has a bug, and we'll call, uh, um, we'll call calculate total, which is something that we did. Um, maybe w what if we will call too earlier? Or what if we will call it twice, for example? So maybe our customer will get uh, a, down, a bill doubled. It's not a good idea, right? So yeah, of course we can solve it. You can use some flags here and there, so you can check everything. But still, boilerplate. What if it's never called at callback? What if it's called too early? What if it's called too late? So, see, sometimes it can be a pain. And we said callback and async, but not, it's not because you have a callback that something is asynchronous, right? You can have a for each, you can have a map that accepts a, a callback, but they are synchronous. So the, what's, how can you understand if something, if a callback is asynchronous? The only way is to read the code. And I can imagine, for example, in, in Node.js, React, whatever project, with all the modules that we have, we can't spend that much time to understand if something is asynchronous or not. So again, don't get me wrong, I didn't want to bash, I'm not here bashing uh, callbacks. I still love callbacks because they are super elegant, they are the, the fundamental unit of asynchronous in JavaScript, but probably they are not enough today. And again, the previous question, first question, what is, what if waiting were just easy as blocking? So, sorry. Of course we have other solution now. Which are promises. So what's a promise? I mean, I know that many of you already knows what's a promise. Let's, let's do a recap. A promise is basically a proxy for a value that you don't necessarily know when the, the promise is created. It allows you to associate uh, some handlers in case your async uh, call, your async functions goes well or even if you have an error. And it's like returning, uh, returning the synchronous methods is like returning uh, uh, values from synchronous call. And the cool thing about promises is that they are always a sync. Remember at the beginning when I told you that basically JavaScript before ECMAScript 2015 doesn't no, didn't know anything about asynchronous, it was the engine. But if you need to introduce the promises inside the language, you need to assure, if you want to assure that something is, a, is a synchronous, always asynchronous, you need to introduce something in the language. And this is the job queue. It's inside the language itself. It's something that unfortunately at the moment we can't use, us as developers, we can't access that queue, it's something internally. And basically it's like taking, a, it's like more or less like the event loop in the sense that 
um, instead of um, instead of the, instead of the compared to the event loop, here you can guarantee that something will be a, a, a synchronous call. How? It's like taking a ride on a roller coaster, and instead of when, when you finish your ride, instead of uh, doing the queue again, you can jump again immediately in another in another ride. Oh, other than being always a sync, it's the promises are handled once because they can, a promise can have these states can be impending when you initialize the initial is, is the initial state of the promise can be fulfilled if something uh, if you get, if you receive the data back let's say can be rejected if something uh, if something uh, happen bad happen and it can be settled it can be either fulfilled or rejected but the thing is that the cool thing here is that once it's fulfilled or rejected you can't change the state basically Another cool thing about promises is they are denable. What it means that to be a promise, you, have the, you need a, the, the then method, okay? The then method will accept uh, other um, functions, other callbacks. In case everything went fine, you will call the unfulfilled function. If, in case have, uh, something bad happened, they will call on rejected. And last thing, important thing, is that a promise always returns a promise. You can return a promise. And you can change, chain the then together. And last thing about promises is that you have a catch method where you can catch all the, all the errors that are happening during the promise call. So like Linus Torvalds says, talk is cheap, show me the code. So this is our load user info, for example, this is an example of from the load user info function. So in this case, basically what we are doing, we are wrapping our, um, our callback, which is our, our call, the request, to our service that will give us back the user info. And then we, also, we are also passing a callback there. So at the end, see, we simply uh, create a new promise, a new proxy object. And in this way, we will handle the, all the async calls. But we keep it, as you can see here, we didn't get rid uh, of the callback, right? The callback is still there, but it's wrapped inside, inside a promise. So at the end, we can. We can uh, basically do that. So it's almost what we wanted to achieve at the beginning. So we can load the user info, then we can load car items, then we can retrieve the exchange rates, then uh, we can calculate the total, and then we also can, can catch the error. So the issue that we were having before with, with callbacks, like control flow, solved. The inversion of control, the fact that you don't know if someone else is calling you m multiple times or never call, whatever, is solved because once a, a project is settled, can't change state. Error handling, also that thing is almost, uh, let's say that it's solved because you have the catch. It's a sync or sync? Basically, it's always a sync. I promise it's always a sync. So it's a big win, right? But there's always a but. Remember in the beginning when I told you, uh, yeah, many people says that use promises so you can solve the callback hell, right? You can still have promise hell, for example. In this way, and I, and I was writing code like this. No shame. I mean, at the beginning, you do everything to understand and to practice, right? But in this case, even here, you have like a pyramid of doom, be a bit of uh, callback hell. Can you avoid that? Sure. So basically, first thing is that, as we said before, a promise can return a promise. So you can align in this way. Then, thanks to our wonderful language, based on the fact that the data structure is always the same, you can also get rid of data, the data everywhere. You can just do this. It's clean code, awesome. Probably it will work. But still, keep in mind that when people tell you, yeah, callback hell, solve it with promises, mm, it's not always the case. You have to use your mind, your brain sometimes. And again, people use promises mainly for control flow at the beginning. But it's not what they are meant to be, of course. If you're using promises, it will help you to have a better control flow. But at the beginning, I was using promises everywhere, everywhere. The thing is that, OK, you have maybe your index file, your app.js file, your, your main file it looks clean. But the rest is clutter, is, is boilerplate, because you are still wrapping all your callbacks, right? And so it's not, I mean, at the end, you are always adding more more code, and sometimes useless. Sometimes you don't, even, you don't even need to know if a callback, if an async call went fine or not. Because maybe you don't, you don't care. Maybe it's a log function that, okay, if it logs, fine. If it doesn't log, who cares? 
And if you're using promises everywhere, your code base becomes promise independent. And I assure you that sometimes can be a pain when you want to use third party modules or even a module written by your colleague that is using promises everywhere and maybe sometimes you don't need them. Because it will also impact your design. So the question is, the promise or to call back? If you have a library, something that you want other people to use, you can support both. Thanks to the fact that in JavaScript you can do whatever you, wo you want, it's total anarchy, you can just basically pass a callback. Even if you don't pass a callback, JavaScript will, wouldn't mind, right? Because you can pass as many arguments as you want, even if you, are not, you don't have, if you, even if you are not forced to use them, it's fine. So in this case, I'm always returning a promise. If the callback was specified in the arguments, I will use the callback. Otherwise, everything is fine and life is beautiful. What, what's the other drawbacks of promises? That's it, it returns always a single value. And once a single value is returned, that's it. Of course, we, there are some way to deal with it, in the sense that if you need to return multiple values, you can just wrap it in an object or in an array. But it's still, the single risk solution is still bad for strings. So, for example, this code. So this is a promise applied to the click event on the browser. Can you do something like this? Sure, it will work. But once you click, that's it. Why? Because once the promise is solved, uh, is resolved, nothing else can happen. So how can you solve this? The other way around. Every time you do a click, you will create a new promise. So what about performances? Well, remember that we said that basically we didn't get rid of the callback. We are, we're just wrapping inside a promise. So it's logic to think that the promises are slower compared to callbacks. But 99% of the time, it's not a real issue, right? Because if you are having performances issues, maybe the problem is somewhere else, or we are Netflix, probably. So performances is not a real issue. Another thing is that promises is not an, another new technique, a new frame of whatever. It's inside the language nowadays. So it's something that we need to, as JavaScript developers, understand, know, and be able to use properly. And it's basically support everywhere. But again, so we didn't achieve what we wanted at the beginning. So what if waiting were just as easy, easy as blocking? What if we can write code like this that from, for my brain, it's easier to read and to understand, to share, whatever. We need to introduce a new, another concept, generators. How many of you uh, knows about generators? How many of you are you really using on production? Liar, okay, <laughs> kidding. So generator is a new thing inside a new thing. Yeah, it's two years old almost. So basically, what's a generator? It's a new type of function, okay, that compared to the normal function in JavaScript, they don't uh, behave like the run to completion uh, behavior. So basically, if you fire up, a, a, if you call a function in JavaScript, a normal function, you can't stop it. Once you call it, it will go. And generators are quite different. So this is a, a very useful uh, snippets of code. So as you can see, the main difference is that you have the star, the asterisk in front of the, the function name that will, tells, it will tell that it's a generator. And then we have another new thing here, the yield keyword. Let's see how it works. So basically, we call the function, okay, and nothing will happen. You are just constructing the iterator. Nothing will happen. In order to start the iterator, because the generators will return an iterator, you need to call the next, the next method on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the function itself. And if we, if we want to print to understand what's inside the, the, the function, that moment, the value, we, we, we can see that uh, at the moment the value is undefined and done is false. This is an object, okay, with two values. It does you the, uh, the value, <laughs> and if the iteration is, is finished. In this case, nothing is happening. So, because we were posing with the yield keywords, okay? So we need to call the next method again. And this time, sorry, basically, with the value will be one, in this case, our x value, and done is true. So I don't have to iterate anymore. I, even if I call next again, nothing will happen. So basically, with a yield keyword, so what we are doing, we are 
posing, okay? We can say AKA, where is it? Okay, sorry. AKA, we are blocking. And now I'm a bit more happier panda, you know, compared to the beginning, because I can, it seems that I can have some control over my flow, over my code. So I can also pose as many times as I want. I just need to call the yield um, keyword. But we said generators will return iterators. So why they call it generators? And they simply call, it, call them iterators. Because iterator is just one side of the, of the coin. The other side is the observable. Let's take another example. In this case, I have another function. Um, what I'm doing here, for example, I'm you're still using the yield keyword, but I multiply the x value. So what, how does it work? Let's do that again. So I'm, I'm calling the uh, generator. So I'm, I'm basically constructing the, the iterator. I will call next. And again, if I check the value, in this case it's undefined, nothing will happen. Then I have the yield. But in this case, to the, with the next, I'm passing a value. Okay, value three. And basically I will call ne calling next. And in this case, basically, the value will be, for, uh, at the end, the value will be 42 because I'm multiplying the three that I'm passing with, uh, from, the, from the generator itself, I multiply by 14. And I'm done with the, with, the, with the generator. So let's do a small recap. With generator, we can block. We see block, of course. Not, it's not real blocking. So, our, our, so we can have full control of our code, more or less. We can pull values with the next. But we can also push the values, right? Because we can also, as we saw before, we can pass the value three. What if we combine? So why am I talking about generators? Because think about that. If you are combining generators on one side, where you can have, full, say, almost full control of your flow, where you can block, stop, let's say, pause your, your code passing value around, and promises, maybe we are getting to what we wanted at the beginning. Because the iterator, will listen to the promises to be resolved, like the load user info. Once the load user info is, res is resolved, it will call next. OK, give me the car items, for example. Once the car items are, 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 are retrieved, again, the generator will call next. Other promise, give me back the, uh, the other stuff. So basically, we can, code, uh, we can write code like this. We have this generator, the get total, and we basically, every time we are pausing, say, OK, before going to the next step, to the car items, um, wait for the, for the user info with the yield keyword. It's cool. But if we call get total in this way, what will happen? Nothing. Because we need something, something else. It will orchestrate and say, next, next, next. What if I have an error? So if you have this wonderful function and if you call it, nothing will happen. You need something else that will manage this call. And of course, in JavaScript, we have tons, tons of libraries that can do that. And one of these libraries that I was trying in the past is uh, course you, I don't know how to pronounce them correctly. So what you can do, you can just pass the get total uh, generator, and it will handle everything for you. It will uh, call the next once all the promises are, are, are resolved or rejected. But probably in the next 2017 will help us without having, again, other external libraries to deal with other code, with other, with other new functionality. It will be async await. How does it look like? This way. So basically, you put async in front of your function declaration. Then you put await when you have to wait. Okay? It's basically similar of what I showed you before with the generator and promises, because that's the concept. But in this case, you don't need any, you don't need any other libraries, libraries to handle and to manage all the flow calling next, the, the engine itself will do that for you. So at the end, we can be, be uh, happy pandas, and sort of, because at the moment we don't have this functionality. But you can start uh, using it, if you are brave enough, with Babel. Um, I think many of you know about Babel. Babel basically will, you can write code in uh, Necromax script 2016, 2017, whatever, with a new functionality, and, will, and thanks to Babel, which is an, an external, uh, external library, <laughs> Uh, it will translate to the latest and stable and most common used uh, JavaScript version. So 
the, the, the talk is the evolution of asynchronous JavaScript. Uh, it's not the only way to deal with uh, callbacks, promises, generators, and, and uh, async await are not the only way to deal with asynchronous stuff. There are other beautiful tools and beautiful concepts like uh, RxJS, Streams, Highland, and so on and so forth. But I wanted to focus more on the uh, what's inside the language. So at the end, choose your concurrency model. Okay. At the end of the day, that's what we do every day, right? We, it's not the hardest thing is not to, uh, let's say, to learn the, the new framework. It's to make choices because we are all uh, uh, good, and, good and smart to new, uh, to uh, learn new stuff. But the, still, the, the the hardest thing in our job is to make a choice. So you can combine everything. You can choose the, your concurrency model. Um, based on uh, what you need at that moment, what's more appropriate. So basically, you need to understand how things work behind the scenes. So that's it. I want to say a big thanks to this guy, because sometimes we don't forget that what we do is also what we, day, we do during the day, even during the night, even during the weekends, is made possible also by other people that will give you for free stuff. Kelly Simpson, for example, uh, released this series of books called um, you don't know JavaScript, you don't know JS, which are freely available on GitHub, but if you want, you can also buy them uh, on Amazon, O'Reilly, whatever. So that's it. Thank you.